road she traveled. And our women who made a difference. Aquila Kids gift to our community. I grew up in Decor, Iowa. <clears throat> My life goal at that point, which is different from you young people, was to, uh, I figured out probably when I got a little bit older that women could be three things. They could be nurses, teachers, or secretaries. And our, those were basically our three choices in life. Can you imagine that? So I thought of all those three, I'd like to be a teacher. And I, I love to teach. And I, then the decision was, what kind of a teacher? So I struggled often between history, which was a love, love of mine, or music. And uh, <clears throat> in the end, after I got through high school, and I had some interesting experiences in high school, I uh, made a decision to run for vice president of the student body. And I was very fortunate because I grew up in a family in which um, uh, I, I never had parents that told me I couldn't do something because I was a girl. Mm -hmm. So it was always the world that would say that to me, and it always was a surprise. So when I decided to run for vice president of the student body, I knew there had never been any guys who had been president, but I thought vice president would be pretty safe, and I ran for vice president. And it, it got to be a kind of an issue for particularly a number of the guys. And they, you know, a number of them would come up to me and say, it's, you know, I, I love you, April. I mean, you're a wonderful friend, and there's no way I can vote for you because you're a girl. I think you'd be great at it if you were a guy, but you're a girl, so I can't vote for you. Mm -hmm. Now, after my speech, a number of my friends that uh, told me they couldn't vote for me that were guys uh, because I was a girl changed their minds and really with tears in their eyes voted for me. So I, I did become vice president. The same thing happened to me when I decided to run for president of the junior class. Once again, that big surprise, I mean, it was three years later, I, I was so surprised. Uh, one of my very best friends said, you know, it's just not proper for you to be a president and I'm just gonna run against you to kind of teach you, you know, teach you that this isn't something you're supposed to do. But I was quite overwhelmingly elected for junior class president, and I and I don't know what it's like in your school, but I didn't want to be student body president because basically we were <laughs> we couldn't make any decisions as student body president. Pretty much was the administration. I don't think that's true now, but it was what it was like then. But junior class president, you could actually do things and make a difference, and you got to organize a prom, and you know you got to do do things. So I I thought that'd be a great position. Then after that, I was pretty sick of being an officer of anything, truly. But uh, when I went off to college, I decided to be a music major. I went two years to Luther College, and then I transferred, sang in Nordic Choir, which was my lifetime goal, was to be, a, be in Nordic Choir, which is the best mm -hmm. choir in Luther College, and one of the best choirs in the nation. And then uh, when I went to uh, college, I, then I finished at the University of Iowa in music. I met my husband in the Wilderness Canoe Base in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota where I was a guide for the summer. Now I don't look like I probably was big enough to be a guide. I was about 100 pounds then, but I could, I could put a canoe over my head and carry it with one arm and, and do a portage. And uh, I was about your size, Emily. And, um, and then uh, I met my husband who packed us in and out of trips. I would be out on trips for two weeks, back for a couple of days, out for two, and, and then we got engaged that summer. And the next summer we got married, which is when I finished my teaching degree, my music. I was a music major, a voice major, and, and but my interest was choral directing. That was what I loved, choral directing. So then Judd and I got married, and he had two years left at Luther College, strangely enough, so I ended up of all things back in Decor, Iowa. I met him up at the Boundary Waters, but I ended up back in my hometown, and I taught music at a Catholic school for two years, commuted. During that time, I felt a call, actually, from God to be a, to be a pastor in the church, and that was um, kind of in the sanctuary of the Catholic Church. I don't think, well, some of my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters don't always like that story, but that's the true story of what happened. And um, so I went back and I talked to my husband and I said, you know, I, Judd, I think I'm supposed to go to seminary. Well, he had always wanted to be a pastor since he was in seventh grade. And he said, that's great. I've been praying for that. Well, then the scary thing is I'd never seen a woman pastor to before. I, I figured I didn't think I could probably even go to seminary, let alone be a pastor. 
So we had met this one kind of friendly professor for about five minutes when they were interviewing students to go to Wartburg Seminary in Dubuque. And uh, we called up Dick Jensen and asked him if we could come and talk to him. And then we traveled down to Dubuque. And then I sat on his porch and I was just in a, a sweat. I was just so anxious because I thought, you know, what is he going to yell at me when I say I'd like to go to seminary? I didn't know. So after about two hours, I finally said to him, what would you think if I, I would go to seminary also? My husband was already going. He said, that'd be great. We've got, a, we've got two or three women already at seminary. Our church had voted to ordain women in 1970, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It, at that time was the American Lutheran Church in America had voted to ordain women in 1970, and I was busy in college, and I didn't even know it. It was kind of a quiet thing. Changed the world, but it was kind of a quiet thing. So I went to seminary, and I loved it. That seminary is four years after college. You have to get your bachelor's, and then you do four more years, and then you're in the Lutheran church, and you can become a pastor. So I did four years in seminary, and then Judd and I went off to our first call. We did our calls together for 11 years. And then 11 years later, uh, I had had a number of people ask me to be an assistant to the bishop, which I had very good friends who were assistant to the bishop. That's the people just directly under the bishop. And they worked 80-hour weeks all the time. They were hardly ever home, and it was terrible, terrible uh, hours and horrible work. And I kept asking di different synods. Bishops would contact me and ask me to apply for assistant to the bishop in their Synod. If you're Catholic, you'd call it a diocese. A synod is the synod that I serve as bishop has 80 congregations, and I'm the I'm the bishop to those 80 congregations to all those pastors. And this was the uh, where the district that I was in in Iowa, where the synod was, you know, about 400 and some congregations, so big big places. So I I had never bishops ask me. I always threw the papers in the basket basket because I was worried about my children. Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to have that kind of schedule. Finally, my husband said, and "This is a very big turning point in my life. The two big turning points in my life was going to seminary, which was a big adjustment, but I loved every minute of it. And the second was when when I made a decision decision to be an assistant to the bishop. And my husband came into the church study, the pastor's office that we both shared, and he said to me, April." Are you going to fill out those papers to be an assistant of the bishop in, it would have been in Minnesota, Rochester, Minnesota. And I said, well, I'll get to it. He said, you're not going to get to it. You're going to throw those papers in the waste basket again. He said, I believe that you have a gift for this. He said, you don't even notice it, but there are always pastors lined up wanting to talk to you. And he said, um, and I think it's because you encourage them. And he said, I think this is your your call and you should take it. Uh, you should apply for it. So I, I did and then I went, the first time in my life I really went to see a counselor. I, I said, to you, I'm worried that my kids will love my husband more than me because I won't be around very much. And I said, I'm worried that my children will become drug addicts. And uh, my husband said, you know, I will stay half-time pastor. Half-time pastor is 30 hours a week. A full-time pastor is about 60 hours a week. And most people think pastors just work on Sundays. But the truth is you're pretty much working all the time. And so um, I, uh, so that was uh, 30 hours a week. Uh, he said, I'll stay with that. You can be full-time. And, and uh, that's how it happened. So I went, became assistant to bishop, and then one of the things that happened in our church is that everybody wanted to have a woman bishop. And women were in elections, but they kept losing. And I would talk, various fabulous women. Now, some of the women I talked to, one of them is a professor at one of our seminaries, one is the first woman president of any of our seminaries, which just got elected last year. Uh, the first head of global mission, which is a $37 million budget, was one of the people I and the, these people, I was constantly trying to talk them into being bishop. They'd run. They wouldn't get elected. The people would kept, keep, kept asking me to run for bishop, and I wasn't willing to do it. And finally, uh, this synod, a person called me up on the phone and said, I've seen you do some things nationally. Um, I really would love to have you as my bishop, and would you let me put your name in for bishop here? And I thought, I don't know anybody in this synod. It's safe. I don't know anybody. Nobody knows me. I can tell all my 
colleagues that have done this. I took my turn. I got, I, you know, went into the Senate where nobody knows me, and I got defeated. And uh, so I let my name go in, positive that there was no chance I would be elected, and promised my children there was no chance I would be elected. And then in February, they had forums, and they discussed names, and I was in the top three in four conferences, three out of four conferences. I didn't understand how that worked. In April, I had to go to forums and speak, and the only re I was really worried about that because I didn't know the conference. I thought I'd, I'd synod, the diocese, or whatever you want to call it. I didn't know anybody. I thought I'd make stupid answers. The most thing I was worried about was saying stupid things. So... But what happened in those forums is I, I realized that I was doing a pretty good job because the guys were taking my answers. We do a forum in the west part of the synod, and then we go the next night into the east part of the synod, and then whoever preceded me in questions, somebody asked them a question that sounded like a question that I was, I was asked in the other one, they'd take my answer. Well, then you can't say, well, so-and-so, you know, John stole my answer. You don't say that. So you just think up a different answer. But that was the one that was the one assurance to me that I wasn't making an absolute fool of myself that people were taking my answers. Is this boring for you? No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, then uh, in June was the election. So this was kind of a six-month process. I first had gotten contacted by phone in February. I promised my children I wouldn't get elected. On the morning of uh, the day before I came to the election, which would have been, the, I believe, the 10th of June or something like that. You, you would know that from my papers, but the, what day? I think it was 10th of June. I say to my three children again, my twin daughters, who are now physicians, and my son, who's going to seminary now, but they were just little tykes. I said, I promise you there isn't any chance I'll be the bishop. My husband and I trot off to La Crosse, and the next morning uh, I give my speech along with the other candidates, and when it's all done... Um, I had almost twice as many votes as the next highest candidate. Now that doesn't usually mean much because you're a woman, they're going to try to, you know, give you a good showing and then you go down in flames basically. But um, at the end, every time a couple people would end up out of the ballot because they would just keep balloting, then I'd get at least half the votes. So at the end of the day I was well over 50 votes of, over the next candidate. And I was the first woman bishop in North America in the Lutheran Church and the second in the world. The first one was Maria Jepson, who was elected in April in Germany. And I was the second one in the world and the first one in North America, the first one in my church. Uh, and that was June 92. There are 65 bishops in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, 5 million um, Five million members, 65 bishops, and now we have seven. I was a bishop for three years, and then we got our second woman bishop from South Dakota, the Bishop of South Dakota. The third bishop is the Bishop of New England. There's not as many Lutherans there, so I, there's several bishops in Wisconsin because we have so many Lutherans. There's Catholics and Lutherans, basically, in, in Wisconsin. But you go out to New England, it's not quite as many, and you go out to uh, South Dakota, there's a lot of Lutherans there, but there just aren't very many people there. So one bishop for South Dakota. So that's there's seven of us now. The bishop in the Caribbean is a woman bishop. The bishop, uh, what we call the Slovak Zion Synod, which is kind of all over the United States but connected back to Slovakia, is a woman. The, the bishop of Upper State New York is a woman. So we're taking over. There's seven <laughs> of us out of 65. Did you always want to be a bishop, or did somebody just... Of course not, because, see, when I, the first time I went out to preach as a pastor, uh, the, in fact, the first time I ever preached, I, I was the first woman I ever heard preach was my own voice. So I had never heard any other woman ever preach, and I hear myself preaching, and I'm the first woman's voice preaching I've ever heard. So that's how weird that is. Everywhere you go, even even years later, people, even now, after I became the bishop here, I would go preach in a congregation. They'd say, we've never had a woman in that pulpit before. And I was their bishop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd go out every Sunday in different churches and, and preach and uh, preside at the Eucharist 
many times. And these are the, the churches that are part of what is called the Synod of the Diocese that I serve as bishop. And I still have people saying, you know, you're the, the first woman. You know, so it doesn't happen so much now because I've been in all their pulpits. But my first couple of years, and people still say to me, I, go, I was just at a call committee the other last week. Call committees are a congregational meeting with the, the people, and they'll say to me, Bishop, we just don't want to have a woman pastor. And I say to them, you know, I've got some feelings about that. It's like they almost forget that I'm a woman when they say that. So we got a long way to go, but it's a lot better than when I, I mean, um, it was very difficult at the beginning, and I have, I think, the best husband on, in the world, absolutely the best husband in the world. And my children obviously didn't turn out to be drug addicts like I thought they would. But my counselor said to me two things. He said, because my mom was a stay-at-home mom, he said, do you love your mom more than your dad? I said, no. So he said, why do you think if you work all these extra hours that your children will love their dad more than you? And he said, secondly, he said, I think your modeling in your life will be an inspiration to your daughters. And they have said many years since then, that was absolutely true, Mom. We wouldn't have been physicians if we ha hadn't had you uh, becoming an assistant of the bishop and then sort of uh, weirdly becoming a bishop later. And I, I think I was clear about that, that, yeah. that, you know, I had one class person, a friend of mine, Becky Shaw, who, Becky Linnevold, who was a year ahead of me who wanted to be a doctor, but that was an in incredibly unusual thing for, for a woman to do. Yeah. And so she just stood out. Here was this friend of mine that was going to be a doctor, who she is. She's a wonderful doctor at the University of Iowa, well-known doctor. But she was so focused. <coughs> and I'm sure, other than our parents, I'm sure she didn't get any encouragement because you weren't, it was just something... If I had ever, I didn't even think about it because it wasn't a possibility. I think it had, pretty much God had to hit me over the head with a two by four in this mm -hmm. situation. I don't think that would happen today. I think you could hear, you know, I, I, not that it was an out loud voice, but just that sense of this is what you're supposed to do, that kind of calling that, that uh, we have, the same feeling my daughters have about being physicians. They just felt that this was God's call to them to be a physician. So I think, you know, you have that sense of that but it was impossible to have that sense when it's not a possibility. You don't think about things that you can't do or be. Is singing pretty much like the one thing that you really, well, not the one thing, but you know, something that you really enjoy? Do you still sing and stuff? Oh, yes. I'm, I, I've, I've actually done a lot of choral directing nationally in our church, and that's one of the reasons that somebody saw me doing some. Now, you wouldn't think that you could be directing music and somebody would think about, hey, I'd like to have that person as my bishop. But it's not just directing music. It was how you spoke at the microphone as far as uh, feeling what would, be, what would be happening at the convention and then uh, kind of setting forth music or teaching music to the, you know, five or 6,000 people. In fact, the first time that I did that nationally, somebody had seen me directing music in, actually, in a church and saw me working with different people and teaching music quickly and they thought this is she's a pastor and she's a musician i'd like her to be the song leader of the it was the women's convention of 7000 women in detroit michigan well i didn't know it was 7000 women so they called me up and they asked me if i do this and uh, i said sure i'll be the song leader i had to teach 25 new global songs now global music in our church is very popular now but Many people will say I was the first person to introduce global music to the church, but I didn't find that music. I was, they gave it to me, they asked me to teach it to these 7,000 people. And you'd have two minutes here, or two minutes here to teach these strange words and strange sounds. It was, it was very difficult. And <clears throat> so I'm coming to that, and I, as I'm getting ready for this, I think I thought there was gonna be like 200 people here. Well, there were 400 people in my choir and 7,000 people at this convention. And I have to get up on the stage and teach 25 songs that people have never learned and just try to do it in little snippets here and there. 
And then you need to make a comment. Like if you have a great speaker for 30 or 40 minutes, it just gets everybody excited. One of the worst things you can do in a convention, this would be if you're a religious convention or not. You just put this file in your brain. The worst thing you can do, and sometimes people in charge do this, they just got to get on to the next item. It's a mistake because the assembly is filled with emotion. They need a way to express it. The right song, the right song that fits the message, you got to pay attention to the message and then pick the right song out of the ones you're working with. You got to have sharp musicians that can g run with you on this. You pick the, you make the right comment that kind of somehow can speak. I mean, that's what we ask pastors to do is somehow speak the hearts of the people to God and to speak God's voice to the people. That's really what you kind of try to do. So you have to be listening and you can kind of sense the moment and then you say maybe the right sentence or two that introduces the music that helps the people express their emotion. So these are not really, it sounds like a little thing, song leader, but it's actually incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. So I was, I don't know, five or six days there I was nursing Ben at the time. My husband brought along Ben, so that was tricky. It's tricky, dashing out and trying to nurse Ben and then get back and lead all this music in front of 7,000 people. But that's what was going on. It was a pretty, pretty exciting time. But I, um, I don't really remember your question. What was your question that oh. you read to me? Mm, I think I came out um, that you do still sing. Yes. I don't do it as much as I used to. I mean, I've been a bishop now since 92. I've been re-elected three times, uh, re-elected two times, elected once, total three times. I'm in my third term. And it's just, you know, I'm busy day, nights, and weekends. I'm writing sermons sometimes uh, when I shouldn't be, you know, I mean, late in the middle of the night and so forth. So I think, um, it's it's been difficult the last few years I haven't done it but up to that point I was I directed in national global mission events and uh, stayed with my music for a long time so you're becoming a bishop has kind of slowed down your singing is that what you're saying like oh sure oh. no I mean I can sing a little bit <laughs> like, like sing yeah. a little bit in the car you know but yeah. um, and I and of course you use your voice as a bishop because you chant yeah. so uh, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad in this. It is, you know, you're you're constantly. If you've listened to, I don't know what your denominational backgrounds are, but if you've listened to, to most bishops have to chant. So, uh, so oh, okay. you ch in fact, you chant long, long lines, and you have to end up on the same note as you started. <laughs> What are the steps before becoming a bishop? Do you have to do certain things to become a bishop? Like? Well, it, it depends on the church body. If you are a Roman Catholic bishop, which, by the way, you can't be because mm -hmm. you are women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you were a Roman Catholic bishop, you would be appointed by the bishop to be bishop. Um, or you may even, you're, I think, even technically appointed by the Pope, although the Pope wouldn't know you, it would be somebody else that brought your name forward. In our church, the people elect you, and that is the clergy and the lay people elect you. And so in a sense, it comes from the people instead of kind of uh, from somebody uh, above you. So I have absolutely no idea how you get to be a bishop in our church. I still don't know how I got to be a bishop in this church. But I think that... Um, People look in their bishop for someone who is uh, discerning and fair because you have a lot of power over their lives, particularly as pastors, and they, they want to have somebody they can trust. And so um, difficult things happen with pastors. I mean, sometimes we've had pastors that have had misconduct, and they have to be removed. It's very difficult. The congregation loves the pastor. They're mad at the bishop. But if a bishop, you know, if a pastor is embezzling or sexual misconduct of some sort, I mean, they're done. And you have to remove them. It doesn't matter if people would like to kind of take a gun and shoot the bishop. You have to do it. So people choose a bishop that they think would be, um, I think they expect you to be uh, a leader. Well, that's kind of a given. You have to be a leader. And 
Um, they ex expect intelligence from you. They expect you to be a, a, a wonderful student of the scriptures in our church. And they um, expect you to be a person of faith. And of course, we assume all of our pastors are strong people of faith. And, and then uh, somebody that they can trust. And so I think that issue of integrity and so forth and, and courage. You have to do a lot of things that are very unpopular as a bishop. And so you really need God to give you the gift of courage. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't recommend it for somebody if you struggle with, with that part of your life. But So have any family members or cousins or anything been pastors? My uncle, <clears throat> two of my uncles are pastors, two of my first cousins are pastors. My husband is the only pastor in his family. Now there's a first cousin that's a pastor. And now our son will be a pastor. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pastors yeah. in my family. <laughs> yeah. No no bishops. I mean, you can't really, uh, in our church, you can't actually decide to be a bishop. The people see the gifts for you to lead them and they trust you and then they elect you and that's kind of what and and I think it's actually we think it's the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty hard to tell the Holy Spirit what to do but mm -hmm. I, it's you know it's a combination of the of God choosing someone and the people having the same sense that that is the one that God would like us to have so if you could go back um, at any time and change something would you change anything? Ha. Huh. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I never think about that. I've run, I, you know, I, I got together with, um, I have four, my four roommates of my senior year at University of Iowa. We've gotten together twice in 30 years. This is our 30th year, if you can imagine, since I was a senior in college. And when my good friend Carol comes from Luxembourg, then the rest of us try to get together. And we were just together a week and a half ago for a day. And two of my roommates, I think, have many things in their life that they would change if they had to do it over again. But um, I've been really blessed. I've been really blessed. And I think I would say that to you. I don't think the bishop part has made me feel more blessed. Um, to be a bishop is a very heavy burden, and you don't want to do it unless you believe that God has called you to do that. Um, and you give up a lot of time with uh, your family and your extended family. It's very hard. It's very hard. On the other hand, <clears throat> the th I think my daughters would say that to see their mom do that and to make a difference mm -hmm. like she has inspired them to make a difference in the world. And there are many, many, many ways to do that. Many, many, many ways to do that. Um, hmm. I sp if I could, if I could do one thing, it would be that um, because you know when you went to seminary and you were a couple, the wife was supposed to work and support the husband. And what happened is that Judd and I did something that the seminary doesn't want you to do. We both worked 30 hours a week and went to school full time. There was never any time to play a volleyball game. There, you know, we either were working or studying or going to class or sleeping. That was all we did for four years. And, um, and we didn't have any support. Normally you have support from a congregation, but we didn't have support. My husband's parents had left his congregation and moved to another state. And I was a woman and meant that, you know, nobody was really very happy about me being in seminary except for my family supported me, but not other people. So... You make hard decisions, and you, you know, I would never want my children to go through seminary and, and work 30 hours a week. It's so very, 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 very difficult. But we were just, we didn't really want anybody to notice, and we didn't tell anybody we were working 30 hours a week because then they would have said, April, what's the matter with you? You're supposed to be supporting Judd. You know, this is a, this is a, this is work for men. And, and so we just, I mean, Judd was very supportive of me, and we just kind of tried to quietly work our 30 hours, and hopefully nobody would notice, and try to stay awake in class because we were so tired from working. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in this day and age, if I could have had somebody 
sponsor us and we're you know so that we would have worked maybe 10 hours instead of 30 hours I loved I loved seminary I loved studying I mean if I and I wasn't I didn't love studying all the way through school but I loved this so um, you said you, you gave up time with your extended family is like the only time you could see your extended family and your family when they come to visit you well I have I get um, <clears throat> I get four weeks of vacation a year that sounds like a lot but if you if you live what happens to most pastors is they live in a community uh, and that's not true with priests, but it's true with pastors, that you get called to places that you have no family at all. So you take your only time that you have, and you're constantly driving to see your family. It makes it very difficult to have vacations where you go do something fun because you have to, I mean, it's fun to see family, but, and you never fit with anybody else's schedule. They, wanna, they want you to come for a weekend. You can't come for a weekend. You've got to be in your church on weekends. So you're always... Even as a clergy, you're always, always out of sync with everybody else. And they say, Pastor, take Mondays off. Yeah, you work Tuesday through, through Sunday, but take Mondays off. Well, who's taking Monday off? Who do you go fishing with? Who do you go shopping with? Everybody else is working. See, you, so you're constantly in a, a position where you're isolated, and your time to go do something is when nobody else can do it with you. So I shouldn't tell you that because I would love for you to think about being pastors. But it's that part is difficult anyway for pastors. And then you get into a bishop's schedule. It's just a completely, completely crazy schedule. I can see my family, but I have to schedule it out months in advance. I should have brought you my calendar so you could see what my calendar is like. But I have to be, my, my next October and November and December is already completely filled. Um. So... Even just people trying to get in to see the bishop, it's very difficult. Sometimes I say, well, I'll see you at 6 in the morning. Will that work? I was out till midnight last night, and that's normal for me. I'm in churches at night. And they're usually upset when I come. I mean, they're usually mad about something. That's why the bishop comes. But it's very, you know you make a difference, but it's very difficult work. What my husband said when I became an assistant bishop, he said, April, I know you've been the cook, but he said, I'm going to be the cook. When you're home, I want you to be take time with the kids. You're not, you don't get to be here a lot, but when you're here, I want you to be totally with the kids. And so he said, I'm going to run this place, and that's what happened. That was a little hard on my ego, but that's what happened. So he can he does laundry, you know. He's the main cook now. Sometimes I cook for company, but basically he's the main cook, and he just took over. So, so. You know, a lot of my traveling is in the Midwest to Chicago, or the main, the central office of the church is in Chicago. But then I go places like to our synod, our companion synod in Ethiopia. I'm going again in February. Um, I'm going to Peru, which is our other companion synod, in September. Um, so that's kind of a normal part of my life. Uh, I was asked to be the Bible study leader for all the women pastors of Africa, which is probably the most fun thing I've ever done. And Musimbi Kanyoro talked me into it, and she kept saying, Bishop, the, uh, the women from Africa, they want you. And I'd say, why don't they ask Maria Jepson? That was the first woman elected in general. They want you. And if Musimbi wants you to do something, you might as well just give up and do it. But I went there for a week in Moshi. We were right below, my, out my back window was Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, which is the only mountain in, in Africa that has snow on the top. You remember studying that? Mm -hmm. David Livingston wrote back to Europe and said, uh, there's a mountain here by the equator that has snow on the top. It's right by the equator. They thought he was lying and making it up, but it's true. And I was right out the bishop's window was, they call it the bishop's suite. They make sure you have the best view of Mount Kilimanjaro. But I taught those women for a week, all the women pastors from Africa that are Lutheran, from South Africa, from Kenya, from Uganda, from Ethiopia, from Liberia. I mean, it was just, it was just a fabulous, fabulous experience. They are amazing, amazing women. So that was probably the most fun thing I've done. But um, <clears throat> our diocese or our synod goes up to Elma and Arcadia. It goes five miles south of Wisconsin Rapids. It goes just about within 10 miles of Wisconsin Dells, down to Prairie du Chien. It includes La Crescent, 
and uh, Spring Grove, Minnesota. So it's kind of a funny shape, sort of shaped like a dove, like a bird. That's cool. So Africa is the longest you've traveled? Pardon me? So Africa is the longest you've ever traveled? Oh, well, my trip to Hong Kong. When, when, I, when I went to Hong Kong, I had a great story on this Hong Kong. <laughs> it had just, this was, Hong Kong was, uh, was that 97? Well, I should tell you I've been on an ecumenical journey. We visit, visited the e ecumenical patriarch at Istanbul. I went with our presiding bishop. That's the bishop of our whole church. I went on his only ecumenical trip at that time, and that was to the bishop, to the, to the ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church in Istanbul, Turkey. Then we went to visit Archbishop George Carey in uh, London. Then we visited, we spent five days with the Vatican, uh, saw the Pope. We were with the Cardinals. I should have brought some of my pictures of that. I didn't remember that. And then, um, and then we went to Geneva, where the Lutheran World Federation is, and the World Council of Churches is, and visited with the head of that. So that was a that was a kind of a state, you know, delegation. It was part of that. Um, then, like I said, in Hong Kong, when we had the 50th anniversary of the Lutheran World Federation, which is the 138 member churches across the world. You know, the Swedes and the Germans and the Norwegians and the, uh, the Africans are there and the, the church from India is there and the church from, from Korea is there and the church from Japan is there and the church from China is there and so forth. That was, uh, I was the one that presided at the Eucharist. You're Roman Catholic, so you know what that is, presiding at the, the wine and the bread and the, yeah. that's what I was, I was the priest at the Eucharist. I was the bishop at the Eucharist presiding. <clears throat> I was a really tremendous honor to do that. And um, I don't remember what you just asked me. I get off on this stuff. Oh, and I was going to tell you this great story. This is a great story. <laughs> so I get, I'm, I'm a little bit wild in the sense that I don't always think about the fact that I'm kind of a woman and I'm a short woman and I'm getting strange places late at night. And I arrived in um, Hong Kong at 10.30 at night, and I thought there would be somebody at the Lutheran World Federation desk that would get, get me where I needed to go. And I get there, they, they had a computer shut down. They didn't know I was coming. Something Because Hong Kong, which used to be not communist, became communist. And so this was six days after the great, you're, you were just little tiny children then. You weren't even going to school yet, but it was a big, huge issue in the whole globe when Hong Kong was going to come under the control of communist China. And so when I, when I arrived there, it was six days after Hong Kong had become under the control of Ch communist China. And I get to the desk and there's nobody there. And I think I've got to find my way to this, they call it a, the YMC hostel. It's kind of like a motel. And <clears throat> that's where I'm supposed to go. And I asked somebody, how do I get there? So I go up to this communist guard, been there for six days himself, you know, and I said, do you know how I get to da 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 He said, take a bus. It was actually pretty adv bad advice, but I took it. I followed it. So I get in this bus, and at 12.30 in the morning, um, and I had huge suitcases full of, in Ethiopia, it was under communist government, and they couldn't get, they couldn't get books, like Bible dictionaries. So I had taken... Ten huge books, bigger than any book you've got in here by a long shot. Big, like monster dictionaries. And I had ten of them in my suitcase. And <laughs> plus my robes for the assembly and, you know, all these other things and all my clothes for a week. And it's so heavy I can hardly lift it. But so this guy basically kicks me off of the bus at 1230 at night. And I'm just by a bar. A bar with there's nothing but uh, Hong Kong men, Chinese men at the bar, hanging out in the street. You know, half of them are cracked in April just sitting there with you know I had to drag my stuff down from the bus and I'm thinking I don't know where this place is obviously there aren't any other women around here it's just me and the Hong Kong men and this one uh, you know what do you do then at that point you just got to trust somebody is what happens so I went and talked to this guy and, and I he didn't speak very much English but he understood what I needed and he decided to help me, and I just trusted him, and I would not recommend this, and don't ever do it. Do what I did. But I did. Mm -hmm. And I trusted him, and he helped me carry my luggage, 
and we went down underneath dark bridges and everything and walked many blocks in pitch dark. So like being a bishop, like a bishop for a lot of churches, like in a wide range, like yes. how like, far? It depends. For instance, um, the area that I have is not is, is pretty close to the area that the Roman Catholic bishop in town has. We have, I call it the Cooley region. That's kind mm -hmm. of my area. But um, you can have, depending on how many people, like for instance, my good friend Andrea de Grutenestal is, what we say, the Bishop of South Dakota. She doesn't hardly have any more, she has a few more churches than I have, but not a lot more. But there are, South Dakota doesn't have a lot of people. <laughs> and so it really varies. Um, bishops can have what, you know, you, you can have a territory where you have to fly everywhere. It's too long to drive. The Bishop of Montana, you know, he'd stick 150,000 miles on his car in a year. He's now the president of one of our seminaries. I think he got tired of being a bishop. But, but you, you know, I'm driving. I'm driving or flying a lot, constantly. And uh, my husband said to me a couple weeks ago, it was the sweetest thing. He said, you know, because I get home late and then I'm up early the next morning, like I was this morning. And he said, you're such a good sport. He said, you've been doing this for 14 years, and you don't complain. He said, you, you get home late, and you got a short night, and you get up and go the next day. Well, people need you. That's part of the part of you. You do work. I mean, I truly think I loved being a pastor, and I'd love to do it again. I loved it. But I think that I am in work that is never boring. I'm, I'm never bored. You never know what's coming at you. There's no way to be ready for it. I mean, one bishop who was just in, he's only, I've been a bishop for 14 years. There are only six bishops in our church that have been a bishop longer than me. So I've been, I was on the executive committee of the Conference of Bishops, and I, uh, I was uh, for almost 10 years. It's the most, um, so I have had a lot of opportunities that even other bishops haven't had, tremendous opportunities. I have received two honorary doctorates, and I've uh, preached at the commencement of five out of eight of our. Uh, so I had had many, many opportunities, and I, I certainly wouldn't have had all of them if I hadn't happened to be one of the first women bishops. I and mean, just a regular bishop isn't going to. I don't care how good your preaching is, you're not going to be the speaker at five out of eight commencement um, seminaries. You know, just you're not going to be asked. So I've had many. I've had more opportunities to be around the world and have that kind of worldwide exposure because of that. And you can't plan something like that. That happens. And I was pretty crabby when I was elected. I, I said to God the whole summer, I would list women to God that I thought should have had to be the first woman bishop because there's so much media coverage, it just about kills you off. The first two years are just a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare, and you just have to kind of, you know how you get up for something? You know, like if you know you have to make a presentation or something, yeah. you get up, kind of your adrenaline gets you up. For, mm. Well, if you're doing that 10, 15 times a day all the time, you know, yeah. you're talking. I was interviewed by, I didn't bring that in, but I was interviewed by the religion reporter of Newsweek, and he just, you know, I was, I was interviewed by um, a media person in Colombia. South America, and he just put me online. He kept calling me until I finally gave up and said yes, and then he he gets me on the, you know, at 7 o'clock on a Friday morning, and I, you know, and he'd ask me a question, and I could, and then I, and then he would translate it to his audience. I could hear all that. Um, it was Bogota, Colombia, when he, and he was so persistent. He got that interview with me. But you know, I just had, I don't even have, I've been so busy, I've never put things in a scrapbook. I had two things I could bring you that somebody else had done for me before I was elected, which I left at home, but I'll bring them back. They've got letters and stuff from people throughout the world that wrote me a congratulatory letter. But I just got boxes and boxes full of gifts and letters and uh I was in Stars and Stripes, that's a kind of the national, um, that's the Air Force Army uh, magazine. 
couldn't find a copy of that for you. <laughs> but you know, you're just, you're just when when something like that happens, the the church was worried about the things that I would say to the media. So the church takes me to Chicago, and they fly in the person that trained people to speak at Nightline. The they have coaches, and the coach that trains people to talk on Nightline, which is that news show at night about ten thirty. They brought him in to, to train me for a day. And so, you know, something like that happens and you are you didn't do anything. You just happened to be the one that was there and I, used to, I was complaining to God and I said, you know, I used to be incredibly shy. I mean, I was phenomenally shy when I was growing up and now I gotta do all this stuff in front of media. But you know, you just live through it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of a, you know, I just have the life of a regular crazy bishop and not that nutsy life I had the first two years, which was really difficult. It was really hard. But I, my work is not boring. There's no way, there's no way you know what's going to come back, come at you that day. Mm -hmm. uh, people come to the bishop when they're stressed, when they're upset, uh, when things aren't going the way they think they ought to go. So you don't usually see very many happy people. <laughs> So you have to be ready to deal with conflict, and conflict is always tricky, because it's always new. This podcast brought to you from across Wisconsin by the Cooler Kids at Longfellow Middle School, in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.